Jordan Morrow, recognised as the godfather of data literacy, has significantly contributed to the field of data literacy. What we're going to need is the ability to understand, ask questions, interpret results, and apply those results over time. And that, to me, is data literacy or data and AI literacy because I don't need you necessarily maybe to build the visualization anymore. I need you to modify it after the tool built you the visualization. His influence extends beyond corporate boundaries. He has been instrumental in aiding various organizations. Jordan is a true pioneer. Data literacy is just one piece of the puzzle, right? It's even in the data and analytics space, AI is one of the latest buzzwords. Data literacy is a buzzword. But it really all boils down to, can we help organizations do things effectively? A must listen. So Jordan, let's talk data. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on today. So father of five, author of three books, one more on the way, godfather of data literacy, as well as being an avid runner. So I've got a question for you. How would you fit that all in? (laughs) Uh, I've been asked this before. Let's just say, gratefully, I'm a morning person, a big time morning person. So I'm up early. Uh, I like to read and journal right during the day. Um, You know, you just have your priorities and and that's what gets there and nothing, pretty much you try not to let anything get in the way of it. Wow, fair play. So how's the fourth book going? It's going well, right? I'm, I'm in the midst of writing it, thankfully, and I love to write. I never realized I would love writing as much as I do. Um, and so I took a break after my third book and came And this fourth book is actually kind of the inverse of what my first three books are for. The first three are really focused on non, it's getting data right, right? By non-data professionals or data professionals. This one is the inverse in that it's basically teaching data professionals how to understand business better because a lot of data strategies aren't bringing a lot of return. They're not successful and it's not because the data professionals aren't good at data and it's not necessarily because a business doesn't want to use data. I think there's multiple things that can get in the way and one of those might be uh, data professionals just need a better understanding of how data supports a business. So. We're writing a book on it. So I want to start with a reflection, if, if I may, um, and go back. So when did you really become passionate about advocating data literacy? Do you remember the light bulb moment? I do. And it, when I had my very first ideas around this, I didn't realize what I was stumbling on. I worked at American Express at the time, and this is all the way maybe in 2015, maybe the end of it. And I was in charge of a business intelligence team, and I was in charge of the training that we were doing for the products we were building. So I would travel back to American Express headquarters in New York, but the way we were training people is on what the dashboards we were building were and how to use them. That's not necessarily training people on how to use data. That's a different thing. And so my audience was not data professionals. It was consumer people. It's like product, maybe marketing. And so I created a new training plan um, to teach like basic statistics. Like I think I was just having fun. This would be cool. And it actually got shot shot down. And I was told no by my executive vice president. Okay. And she said, they're not ready for that. Maybe in the future. Now, I'm actually grateful it was turned down because I, if I had done it there, I don't know if I go anywhere else with it. And But I don't know if the idea ever left my mind. And so uh, Click, the data and analytics vendor, had a position open. And in the very first interview, um, I was told, you're the guy for the job. But I had to go through their process. And a lot of people don't know this. I almost pulled out. Well, not necessarily pulled out of the process, but mm-hmm. the, the ball was dropped on my recruiting Right. And so my wife and I were like, yeah, maybe this isn't for us. It got picked back up. I started and then boom, there it is. So my f- my first idea was probably all the way back at American Express. But I don't know if I ever knew or realized that this would become what it has. Uh, if you had told me I would be traveling the world <laughs> or sitting on a podcast, writing books, the answer would be no. But I love it. And you know, data literacy is just one piece of the puzzle, mm-hmm. right? It, it's... Even in the data and analytics space, AI is one of the latest buzzwords. Mm -hmm. Data literacy is a buzzword. 
But it really all boils down to can we help organizations do things effectively? And yeah. the reality is that could be tough. And, and data literacy is just one of those pieces. Absolutely. So do you think that first knockback gave you an idea of the challenges to come? Because I appreciate it's not always easy influencing people that aren't necessarily, you know, in the data field, why it's so important. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I at that very first moment realized it, right? Because I just had an idea and she was like, nah. And they tried to change my job and I didn't want to go to like, they wanted me to be more database administration. That's not me. I like teaching. I like training. Um, but it was interesting because at Click, when I was there, we start building it. We didn't announce to the company that I was there for about 11 months because this was totally new. I wasn't selling the product. We eventually gave my data literacy program away for free and it was new. Gartner hadn't even launched the first article they had on it. So this was a whole new world. And after 11 months, I think it was, no, 10 months roughly, I spoke at Click's user conference. I had five breakout sessions. All of them, maybe less than one, all were standing room only, maybe four of the five. One of them had to be repeated. And that was kind of the proof of concept that, hey, there's something here. Gartner had launched an article. Um, so I, I don't know if I ever really truly realized what I was stumbling upon. It was just a nerdy idea, if you will. It was just, let's have fun. I was product agnostic. I was basically an entrepreneur within Click. Um, and lo and behold, here we are today. And how amazing though, they gave you that platform and just said, go for it, pretty much. Yes. Not in yeah. simple terms. <laughs> Huge shout out to Kevin Hannigan. <laughs> Kevin Hannigan was uh, the guy who hired me and amazing. still a buddy of mine. Um, and he and I essentially shared a similar vision. Sure. And he just let me my thing amazing so what were the core components then in terms of building that program would you say so part of it was we at the very beginning i would say you're just kind of throwing ideas out and seeing what sticks and and what works and but it came down to we we latched on to a definition that came from raul bardoff and catherine dignacio and and they were at emerson and mit university um i think catherine was emerson and raul was mit and we started to build around that, but at first I didn't even call it just data literacy. I think we had like data literacy, maybe data and analytical literacy, analytical lit I mean, so we had multiple names. And so what it became though was, you know, I remember being at a conference and I think all the trends that I were seeing was there need to be plans put in place, like programs to drive this. And someone brought that to me and, it, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I was already like, yeah, I'm already working on it or my mind was already there. And so we follow the trends as it was being built out. The core tenants are though, not everyone needs to be a data scientist. Everyone needs to have data literacy skills. And the way I, yeah, and the way I teach it is everybody already does to an extent, right? Here's, here's my smartphone. When I travel, I need to check the weather app, use that data to make a decision on what I'm going to pack, right? That's a data-driven decision. That's data literacy. So instead of telling people they're not data literate, it becomes, you have some skills, can we just give you more that makes you compete better in the world today? And so I think that that helps people buy in better. And it's very rare, I would say, that you don't get buy-in for data literacy. What's interesting mm. is usually the people who have problems with the term Sure. Are data professionals, not non-data <laughs> professionals. Non-data professionals are like, sure. Data professionals are like, oh, don't use that term. You don't want to call people illiterate. And I'm like, we say financial literacy, and I don't know how many people have an issue with that. I'm not sure why. I, I'm a big believer. I want gaps and weaknesses or things I'm not good at brought to my attention. Um, and sometimes it needs to be blunt. So in terms of data storytelling then, is that important would you say trying to get the buy-in from those data professionals? Oh, it's, it's important across organizations and it's vastly important. The fourth characteristic, so the definition of data literacy is the ability to read, work with, analyze, and communicate with data. And without good communication, how are you going to do this? Imagine building an amazing data model. The analytics go through the four levels of analytics. You have got amazing insight to help the company and you're crap at telling the story. Yeah. You can't <laughs> communicate it. What, what's going to occur then at that point? Are you going to get anything from it? And I think that's a problem. And I think, yeah. so to me, 
data storytelling and communicating with data is almost the secret sauce yeah. that allows it to work. Um, and so, yes, it is so important. It's a key skill to have. And I can tell you're very good at it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what examples do you give then? Because you really want to get on a level with people, don't you? So they understand. Because I think a lot of people maybe would come to your presentations um, and, you know, lessons and sessions and think, oh, OK, I don't really know what data is. So what core examples would you give to someone to make it relatable? Uh, I love that you called it relatable. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was interesting. When I wrote my third book, mm -hmm. I use personal or human examples, yeah. non like professional examples, because people relate to that. And in my third book, my editor basically was like, don't use too many personal examples. And I'm like, <laughs> no, we're, we're going to use personal examples. So I'll, I'll use a prime example that I use all the time on stage. And it deals with the four levels of analytics, but it'll show how data can be used, right? So the four levels of analytics are descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. And so when I tell this story, I, I tell people, imagine that you're sick. You go to a doctor and the doctor says to you, you're sick, leaves the room and never returns. Basically, that doctor gave you a descriptive analytic, but that's not necessarily what you need, right? They described what is happening. And that's what data does in businesses. That's what... BI tools are. That's Microsoft Excel. That's what they are, is they give a good descriptive analytic, but that's just the first step. So now you're at the doctor and the doctor says, you're sick. Here is why. That's your diagnostic analytic, right? And so in the data space and in the analytic space, you get your dashboard or whatever, and it says, this is what happened last quarter. Now you need to figure out why it occurred. Because if a doctor could figure out why you're sick, they could build a prediction that says, if you do this, this, or this, you'll get better. And that's what we want to do in data and analytics is this is what happened last quarter. Here's why it happened. Let's make some ad adjustments and predict what will happen. And then the final level of analytics is prescriptive analytics. This is machine learning to a degree. In the doctor space, we get prescription pills. That is something that fixes us. Well, think of prescriptive analytics as something telling us what to do. Now, that right there, usually that can help people kind of center their mind. They're like, ah, oh, because businesses need to do the same. You build descriptive analytics, you figure out why things are happening, you build predictions, and sometimes you allow the machines to tell you what to do. Now, just like a doctor, doctors don't always get it right, right? They, they, get, they get your diagnosis wrong, so you go back to the drawing board. Same thing with data and analytics. It's not perfect. So we go through the process, keep going and going, and it is an ongoing thing. So that right there, I think, helps for a non-data professional to be like, okay, just imagine that data and analytics is a doctor for a business, figuring out what's going on, finding the good and the bad, moving things forward, sometimes using machines. That's all they need to know. Very few people, right? 90 to 99% of people will not be technical data professionals. End of story. So if we're trying to invest in data and analytics, we better empower the 90 to 99 percent to use it effectively or we're just going to be throwing money at things and maybe not getting the return that we want. Yeah, 100 percent. And that word empowerment is so important, isn't it? Giving people that confidence that they truly understand, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not a biz uh, Sorry, it's not a, a, a board level issue is it it's a business issue and if those don't know how to use data within the organization you know you're never going to hit your goals whatever that may look like if the, the whole business isn't bought in i think we forget like buying a data tool is not a strategy mm. your business strategy is also your data strategy data is a supportive tool to get it done there's a lot of fear and intimidation around data and ai and we need to remove that we mm -hmm. need people to feel empowered that we're not trying to make them super technical. We don't want your job to be lost. What we want is that you can support your career using data. You can support your business using data. And I think that that's very important for people to realize because they're fearful. AI is everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Is AI going to take my job? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't need to know how to code AI. Can we teach you how to use it well to empower you in the business? That's what we want to do. And I think we've got to make sure that that messaging is there so that that fear and intimidation can be removed. 
Yeah, 100 percent. And in terms of data literacy, then, because the data space is ever evolving in terms of the fundamentals, then have they remained the same over the past decade, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Really? Right. And, and it's because when you think of those four fundamentals, mm. reading, working with data, analyzing data, and communicating with data, those are the same. It doesn't matter what the tool does. It doesn't matter what AI does. Can you read the data or the AI? Mm-hmm. Do you know how to work with it within your position? Can you analyze it to make sure it looks good and you're finding insight? And can you communicate with it? Mm-hmm. Those four characteristics are going to be there. They're going to remain there. Um, because they should empower you as new technologies, as new things advance, they should empower you to succeed pretty much no matter what. Yeah, 100%. And I was going to say, because you've worked for pretty impressive organizations, United Nations, Nike, Disney, as well, to name a few, and global audiences as well. So I imagine I'm already answering the question, actually, but do you need to tailor your you know, training at all, or is it pretty standard throughout, would you say? It's a combination, Mm. right? So the reason I call it a combination is the principles remain the same, Mm -hmm. but the data that an organization uses is going to be different. So if I'm working for Nike and we're selling shoes and we're trying to market and we're doing all this, data and analytics principles and data literacy principles are the same, but how you apply it to that organization's data is different. Mm -hmm. If I'm working in the healthcare industry, principles are the same, its application with the data is different. And so that's how when, when you talk, if I'm talking to the United Nations or I'm talking to a bunch of data scientists, it's going to be different. Sure. Um, but the principles remain the same. So, mm-hmm. yes, you tailor it, mm-hmm. um, but it's mainly based off of what a business is trying to do versus the principles themselves. Sure. Okay. And have you had, in terms of challenges that arise, are these generally the same challenges as well? They are. And, and I think it's, it's kind of universal that even with data literacy, I would probably say data and analytics challenges across the board are pretty universal right now, mm-hmm. right? You're seeing mm-hmm. chief data officers probably either quitting or being let go. Yeah. And it's not necessarily them. I, I've come to this realization over the last few months where what I'm, what I'm learning, or at least in my opinion learning, is there's kind of this scale that we're trying to balance. Mm-hmm. Organizations have, I think, huge, huge desires to use data and AI. So that side of the scale gets weighed down here. Mm-hmm. The other side of the scale is how much is an organization willing to invest in those things? 100%. Because if they're not willing to invest at the same weight that they are putting on those things, that might set the chief data officer up to fail because they want all of these things and they get a very tiny budget. Yeah. Right. I've experienced this. I think if you were to go around, people say it's all the data products are bad. You might have some people say it's data literacy. No, I think a lot of it comes down to do organizations truly understand what this takes. And if Mm -hmm. they don't, then they need to be educated on it. It doesn't mean that you need AI right off the bat. (laughs) It might be, stop it, don't worry about AI. Let's really get your business intelligence world to be successful first. Let's get your data governance set up first. Mm -hmm. But that's not the sexy thing, right? That's Mm -hmm. not the shiny object. And so without doing that right, I I have a fear that we're still not going to see data and analytics ROI be where it should until that scale gets balanced better. Yeah, get your BI before you get your AI. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. I think people hear the buzzword, don't they, and jump on the bandwagon. We want data uh, strategy. We want to be data centric. We want a culture that's data first. But what does that actually mean? And, you know, you've got to feel sorry for those going in and CDO roles or early adopters of data within an organization, because, yes, it's a challenge and some people want to undertake that. But if you haven't got the time from the C-suite and those other areas of the business or the money, then it's doomed for failure. Absolutely is. And it's and that's unfortunate because I think a lot of data professionals get blamed Mm. and I I don't think that's where the blame is. And I don't know if we should be blaming or shaming anybody Mm -hmm. on it Mm -hmm. because that's not going to be productive. I think I call it almost like we need a renaissance in the data space (laughs) because I I hate to see some of these some of these companies like the big, big behemoths and Mm. Amazon, a Google and Apple 
they have the money to do this well. Google, I just saw today, Google laid off people. And if I remember, it was Google was doing it to redirect funds or sources to AI. Right. What about the mid-sized companies that are trying and they don't have that resource? Mm -hmm. it, it, so there's this haves and haves nots that could really get even bigger because of that. And so what I want companies to be doing is take a step back yeah. and say, where did we throw money in data and AI? How good is it working? And if it's not working, they need to have the guts to kick it to the curb and start again or evolve it and iterate mm -hmm. because those haves and haves nots could become a big issue. And I don't want to see that. I want people to thrive. I want businesses to use data effectively and ethically. I think mm -hmm. that's going to be a challenge at times too. And so we just, I, I just need this different mindset to take a hold because AI came out or, well, it's been around forever, but GPT mm -hmm. came out November 2022, um, changed the world. Yeah. And if you want to be able to use it as a business, let's make sure you're investing and doing it right. Yeah. Do you think it's because some businesses are risk averse and they're scared of the unknown and they've kind of got a limiting mindset in that sense? You know, rather than a growth I, mindset, they've adopted a, a scarcity mindset. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I and, and yes, I think that could be a part of it. I think that some don't just don't know mm. this could be a data literacy issue in some cases because i think here here's a way i've described it in the last maybe month or two if you go to a business mm -hmm. and you ask a finance manager what marketing does they could probably give you an idea of what marketing does if you ask a marketing person what does hr do they probably have an idea but go ask those people what does data do and i wonder if they know I wonder if they understand what data should be doing. I wonder if the data mm. professionals are good enough at communicating to get the right message across. I wonder if the C-suite has a sound understanding that a data strategy should be no different than your business strategy. It should be, this is how data supports the business. I wonder if they understand data governance and the fundamental need to have good data on the back end to help the front end succeed. So I think data analytics and AI is almost I don't know the word, a mystery world because <laughs> yeah. it's just not commonly understood or known. Yeah. And so it, it's this whole, I think that plays a part that they might have scarcity mm -hmm. mindset. They might be limiting it. They might not understand. So they, no offense to data vendors, a data vendor can come in there and make data look amazing. Mm -hmm. But the moment that business puts it on top of their own data, it's not very successful. Yeah. Those are different things. And so I just think the right communication and the right conversation needs to be had for businesses to have better success in this. Yeah, you've made an example very relatable again. I think you should use that next one in your, in your talk again, because that's absolutely right. I don't think people could answer that question. And like I said, it's ubiquitous, but a lot of people are like, what is data? What does data do? What do data people do all day? Just look at numbers. Well, it's not that simple. Um, so that I think that's a really, really good point. No. So in terms of going forward then, what are your predictions for the future of data literacy and how that could look? Well, it's interesting. When ChatGPT came out, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, did I just become obsolete? <laughs> was I erased or was data literacy erased? And then I had a friend say to me, no, she was like, you became more important. Of course, yeah. Um, and I think that's the case. I think what's going to occur with data and analytics and AI mm -hmm. is it's going to become more powerful. The technical skills are going to be less needed yeah. because the tools themselves can do a lot of the work for us. What I think matters most is data and AI literacy from the standpoint of, one, understanding how it works. Two, understanding how to ask good questions of the data. Mm -hmm. Three, being able to interpret either what the data analytics or AI says to us. Does this make sense? How can I apply this to the business and so forth? And then, of course, we have to make sure that we're following ethical practices. Yeah. Right? The, the fact that there's going to be more regulations around things. So I personally think technical skills from are, are maybe going to become less and less. We're just not going to need it as much as the tools and the AI and the technology are good. What we're going to need mm -hmm. is the ability to understand, ask questions, interpret results, and apply those results over time. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is data literacy or data and AI literacy 
because I don't need you necessarily maybe to build the visualization anymore. I need you to modify it after the tool built you the visualization. I need you to then apply it to a data story. How do you take the results, communicate it internally, and so forth? Um, and so I think that's going to become uh, a key element. And so that's why certain programs and training and things like that mm -hmm. need to get strong so that a workforce know, knows how to do that. Yeah. And interestingly, for a real cultural shift, as we're looking for, it really starts with early education. Now, I don't know, do you have any programs with schools? Is that something that you've explored before? Or do you think that is something that we need to implement in our curriculum? I, I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you, you hear people talk about in high school, should we be teaching this or should we be teaching finances and how to manage your money? Mm -hmm. Should we be teaching this or teaching how real estate works? <laughs> should we be teaching this or should we be teaching how to read and use data? Right. I think that is key. Do I see it becoming bigger? I do. Yeah. Little sneak peek. I'm a part of a uh kind of children's teenage data literacy book that's coming out. It's oh, probably wow. more for younger kids. Yeah. Um, and that'll be coming out here. I think it's this year that it's coming out. That should be tapped into the education system. Mm -hmm. I see um, I've been able to help it at colleges or universities. So I do. I, I agree. I think that there needed to be a shift in education anyway. Yeah, yeah sure. Right? sure. We, we've seen the world shift massively. But I don't know how much education has shifted with the world. And mm -hmm. so, but yeah, my children know that I'm the guy who tells them never to stop asking questions. I have five <laughs> kids. I get too many questions. <laughs> and so sometimes I tell them, be quiet. Um, but they know that dad says, always ask questions. Sure. Never stop. Yeah. Because adults, like children are the best data literacy detectives. Mm. Children are amazing. They're always asking questions, figuring things out. You know what adults are really bad at? Mm -hmm. Asking questions and figuring things out. We just get information and I mean, just look at social media. Here's information, it must be true because it's on the internet, right? Yeah. No, stop it. <laughs> like, let's critically think and yeah. things like that. So I, I, what I would love is kids to grow up always being critical in a good way towards data and information. Ask yeah. a couple questions, it might be accurate, but you're still asking questions. That's what I want the education system to teach is this curiosity and creativity and critical thinking. Those are my three C's of data literacy. I just don't want it to go away. But as adults, man, we're just we're just not good at it anymore. No, we're not. It's we, we just get things instantly, we don't we? Instant gratification without really needing to even think about it. You get an answer, then you forget about it and move on to something else. Yep, exactly right. So those are the three C's. So curiosity, what was the other two, sorry? creativity mm -hmm. and critical thinking. Okay. It's very interesting. I'll ask an audience, you know, how many of you think you're creative? Mm. And I don't get it like the majority of people raising their hands. Mm -hmm. But if you look at children, I think they're pretty creative. Yeah. Pretty much probably all of us are close to everybody. As kids, we're creative. What happened? Mm -hmm. right? I don't know. Could we say it's the education system? I don't know. It'd have to probably be studied. Is it that we get overwhelmed and there's just too much? I would also like to see that happen in the data space. Mm -hmm. I think people are overwhelmed with everything that's out there. Yeah. So for me, it just boils down to take a step back, reassess what you're doing, and then and, and figure it out. Don't worry so much about what are we doing here, what are we doing here. Instead, say, what is my business trying to achieve? Okay, how can data support that? I think that's helpful for people to learn and grow. Yeah. Do you know, I'm reading a book called Move at the moment, and it actually talks about the power of creativity. And the, for the first time on record, children's ability to be creative is declining for the first time ever. And they think it's because of just, yeah, like you said, being overwhelmed and the digital revolution and, and day we're living in, where we just have things instantly. Because if you think about it, when you are a child, you have a lot of time. And I remember I used to say to my mum, I'm bored. And she say, oh, she used to say to me, only boring people get bored. And then I used to have to go and think about something to do. So I'd go and, I don't know, create a den, do a puzzle, do this, do that. But now it's like you don't have the opportunity to be bored because you've got your phone, you've got a TV, you've got a game. So I do think that plays a huge part in it. It does. There's a, a book out there. In fact, it might be sitting by me somewhere. <laughs> I finished it recently called um, Stolen Focus. Mm -hmm. And it's by Johan Hari. And I recommend people read it. Mm -hmm. On the back cover alone, it says a teenager, and I might mess the wording up, hopefully not, a teenager can focus on one task, an average or something like that, of 65 seconds. That's it. 
Okay. An office oh. worker, so adults, I would say, an office worker, the number is three minutes, right? So the, you're exactly right. I look at my kids and, and when they come to me and say, what can I do? <laughs> like, I, they know I hate electronics. I mean, I understand there's a place for yeah. it, right? Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I tell my wife, when I'm a kid, I'm biking around a neighborhood. You leave at lunchtime. You're not even yeah. back till dinner time. My parents didn't know where I was, per se. I'd go play at a lake. <laughs> like, I can't imagine my mom being happy if I let my children go play at a lake without adult supervision. You know what I mean? Mm. And so you're exactly right. Like, in this book, Stolen Focus, the distracted world that we live in, one of the reasons, if I remember right, is too much information out there. Mm -hmm. Right? There's just too much. Yeah. And so we, in the past, you would stand at the grocery line to buy your groceries and you didn't have a phone to pull out and check your social media feed. Yeah. But what do people do when they're waiting nowadays for a Starbucks or a coffee or groceries? You pull your phone out. Mm -hmm. And so like there's another book out there called Deep Work by Cal Newport. That one's probably on my shelf back here. <laughs> and he says in that book, your brain has capacity for four hours a day of deep work. Right. And I would argue, I don't know one person who gets all four hours in. Mm. And I'm a guy who gets up early and likes to read and all that. And I like to dedicate time to study and I'm not getting four hours. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we have to, the, the Renaissance, right? It doesn't even go there. This could be a whole other episode, mm -hmm. non-data talk, right? <laughs> but let's talk distraction. Um, but I think the data space, Right, the data space is full of distraction yeah. too. Yeah, you're oh, right. look how cool AI is. Look how cool that vendor is. Look at that visualization versus what's our strategy. Mm -hmm. I think we have to remove the distraction and do it right. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to move, but coming back to data as well, they were saying about creativity really does spur in people when you are moving. And if I think about it, I, I like to run as well, like yourself. And that's where I get some of my best ideas. I'm like, right, I'm going to go back to the office and implement this. And, and do you find that as well yourself? Is that why you like to run? For many other reasons as well, I imagine. I, I absolutely... Right. Like, I, I think there's uh, data, <laughs> go figure, there's data that supports <laughs> that, like, moving while you work or, or moving creates ideas and, and creates connectivity across yeah. the brain. So I have a treadmill right there next to me or, or close to me that I can put a treadmill desk on Stop. and I can work while I'm walking. On <laughs> and yes, my work is better when I do that. Really? Um, and so... Yes, absolutely. I think you hear people say that, right? Is, <laughs> is you, you sit at your desk, you work, you work, you work, go for a walk. I think the data shows you should be going for a five or 10 minute walk every hour. Yeah. How many people do that, mm -hmm. right? How many people get out into the sunlight and allow vitamin D to hit you? Like all these things that we should be doing, and I'm a huge health nut, right? It's instead of doing what we should be doing in these cases, we are impeding what, I mean, humans are amazing, but we impede that creativity and amazing things that can be done in data and everything mm -hmm. because we're, we're caught in the rat race, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of data in your personal life, is that something that is always on your mind? Is it like an obsession? I don't know how it is to live in constantly just thinking <laughs> about data all the time. <laughs> Yeah, it it it's it, it may be too much of who of I of who I am. Yeah. So, I've had to get to the point because I question everything. I want people to question everything, mm. but there is a balance, right? If my wife is telling me about a study she read the other day, <laughs> she's not looking for data, Jordan, to come out and question <laughs> it, which I have done in the past, and that's not a good thing. She just wants husband Jordan to listen to something she found interesting, right? <laughs> and so, I do think there's a balance between um, doing it right and doing it well and yeah. understanding how to do that from a personal perspective. Um, because yes, sometimes if data comes out, um, yes, you've got to question it. I mean, look at politics today. I mean, come <laughs> on. Like you should be questioning pretty much everything put out by a politician. Um, but then if your wife's like, I read something cool the other day. And in fact, I used to joke whether it was true or not. It probably was. Like if my wife and I were on a couple's date with someone else and she's trying to bring up a study she found she would turn to me and say shut up jordan or, or maybe not even turn to me but be like shut up jordan because all she wants to do is talk about it yeah not have jordan come in and be like all right let's blow it up mm -hmm. now this proud data nerd is that my wife has gotten to the point where she 
thinks differently about data. Right? Mm-hmm. She's like, I'm not sure where the data came from. We might have to see how it was pulled or whatever she would say. I was like, ah, that's data <laughs> literacy. That's picking it apart in a healthy way to make sure you're getting the non-emotion driven response, right? I think that's one of the keys. I tell people leave emotion at the door because you're trying to find objective truth as much as you can with the data and information to make a decision. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I was just about to mention that actually, I adopted be data driven as a value last year, purely because I was making such emotional decisions in the moment. And I think a lot of people do. And I would just wasn't looking at the data. Although, you know, I operate in the space, obviously it's an important part of what I do. I let emotions take over. So is that something you talk about as well? You know, when you go and do presentations? Yeah, and, and it's something I should probably talk about more because it's – you're exactly right. Look, I I don't want to remove the human element, mm-hmm. right? I don't want to remove that. I want your gut feel. I want your passion. I want your experience, intuition. All of that is a part of this because part of that could be driven off on personal data, yeah. right? I might have a gut feel about this scenario. An example I have used goes along the lines of this. Imagine you're a firefighter fighting a fire. And you hear a popping noise and you know that or your experience is driven. I've used to say something like eight or nine out of ten times. That meant the floor was about to collapse. So you hear the popping noise. You get people out. Mm -hmm. That isn't necessarily me looking at the numbers. That is an intuitive thing because you have experienced personal data Mm -hmm. to bring you information to make a decision. So I'm good with that. Like everybody needs to understand you have your own personal data. That's great. What I want to do is bring objective data with it, remove your personal emotion and bias away as much Mm, as you can. And sometimes it means your personal data was good. And sometimes it means you need to shift and pivot and do things differently. And I think that if that mindset, a Mm -hmm. growth mindset, allows us to shift and evolve and use data more effectively. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's the thing. So are these stories that you tell people to get the buy-in, do you give these clear cut examples? Yeah, absolutely. The mm-hmm. the fire one is one that I talk about. I talk about the human element being in there. Everybody has a seat at the data and analytics table. Mm-hmm. We need your ideas. We need your experience. Um, and we need because it could be you if imagine you're this person. And you've got five of you who think the exact same. Mm -hmm. You're all data professionals doing data science. And all you do is go off of your mindsets. Yeah. That's not necessarily good because you want different views. I want opposing views. I want you to critique the work. I want you to question it so that you can arrive at the best answer, Mm -hmm. not a personal answer. Those are different things. I want the objective data and personal to come to light. Mm -hmm. And people need to have, this is the culture side of it. This is getting buy-in because people need to understand ideas that you've used in the past. It's not bad, but they could be blown up because we now have data, which we didn't in the past. We do now. So we have to have that growth mindset that says, okay, I am open to all my work being incorrect. Let's move forward. And that is hard, I think, for people to do. Yeah, 100%. Have you got any examples when you've consulted for a business um, and you haven't been successful in rolling out data literacy just because of the culture that they had in place? Yeah, it's normally people are are really receptive. But I can think of one example where I forget if I was talking to a CTO or a C. It was probably a CIO or CTO. I do not believe it was a chief data officer. And their mindset was, we've already got this. Yeah, right. We're already there. Yeah, I'm willing to bet that if I had gone into that business to truly see, it'd be like it, it becomes a good luck, right? Good luck. What I should have said and, and been blunt about was, right? Show me. Let me talk I want to you them. to show me how data is being used to improve. Yeah, yeah. show it to me. Yeah. And I think that right there is a good question to ask. If if I'm talking to a company. And they're like, well, I think we're doing this pretty well. I'm like, great. I, th- I think it's awesome you feel that way. Let's take a look. Yeah. Show me exactly how your data is supporting these four business objectives. Give me concrete data itself that this is working. Mm-hmm. And if you can, wonderful. That's awesome. Now let's see if we can improve it. And if you can't, well, then you've got to change your mindset. Mm-hmm. That That is, and, and no offense to most, if not every organization I've come across. Yeah. Right? You might have pockets that is doing it well, 
But I don't know of one organization across the globe that I've worked with that was doing it all holistically well. Yeah. Right? They're just not. Yeah. And I think that people need to have that, you know, realization so that they can do it right. So what does success look like then, would you say? Success for me is continuing forward progress. And it depends on the organization. Some organizations might have really, really good data architecture and modeling. And they're far advanced on that, but they're not getting good front-end analytics. So success for them could be keep up the good work on the modeling and engineering. Let's improve how well your analytical work is doing. Some companies' success can be all the way at the very beginning. They just want to get started. Awesome. So your success is setting up a simple database, setting up some simple BI, and then evolving. So success to me is, number one, you cannot think you have arrived. (laughs) If you think you have arrived... I might say to you, good luck, because you might be bypassed pretty quick. But number two, it just depends on where you are on your journey. For me, it really boils down. One of the key to success, I would say, is what is the mindset and the culture of the organization? If the mindset and the culture of the organization is strong and always trying to improve and iterate and move forward on data and analytical work, understanding you have gaps maybe and all this, thumbs up. If the mindset is we're set we don't need anything more. I'm going to be like, good luck. I don't want to work with you because this could be near impossible. Um, and the other side of it, this is that going back to my scale, a success factor to me is taking a look at the investment and budget that exists for data and balancing it with what I'm hearing from the company and their desire to do it. If it's not balanced, I might say to you, good luck. Um, and so we've just got to make sure that that and, and it's funny to say investment and budget is such a key part of this, but it is. You could have the best chief data officer in the world and they are not giving him a budget or her a budget and the investment is not coming through. Don't care. Like you, you have to throw money at it like you do other areas of the business if you want to have it succeed. Yeah. And whilst you're talking, maybe one of the challenges that has arisen is the fact that data is a never ending journey, ultimately data strategy. Whereas to counter that, those investing may want immediate results. You know, where is our money? What's that gone on? But because it is a journey and it's a culture, you don't always have that visibility. You're exactly right. And I think what's interesting about this is it will probably always be a journey yeah people have been using data (laughs) who knows how many centuries in the past probably since the beginning of mankind data shows me i go outside the sun's up i'm not going to be harmed i go back in the cave when it's dark so i'm not eaten right that's data all the way to now where we should be making smarter decisions because of the prevalence of data but do we have that ability to make smart data-driven decisions do we know how to data story tell Do we know how to apply it to the business? That's the key. You're exactly right. People like the easy button. People want the instant results. And you have to teach people properly that that can't necessarily occur. I don't care what you do. It takes time probably to get your data in a good spot. And then once the data is in a good spot, it takes time to get the tools in the right spot and the training in the right spot. Like this, this lack of understanding that the easy button doesn't exist no. needs to go away. Yeah, Companies need to realize this could be a one to two year journey. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Yeah. Wonderful. If you realize that, you invest in it right, you hire right. You're <laughs> so do you think data should be on the bottom line? So this is, this is an interesting question mm-hmm. because it can be hard to tangibly see exactly the attribution given to data on a project. So for example, if you are running a marketing campaign, how can you truly attribute the results to the data, right? It's a part of it. Mm. I think that for me, what should really be measured is how well are we using data against business objectives? Okay. Yeah. Right. It is an asset. Mm -hmm. It can be a very tangible asset. It can be monetized internally or sold. Mm -hmm. But really what matters to me is I can build amazing data visualizations and I can have a team build amazing analytics, but the moment I can't tie it to business decisions, then what good was that asset? Yeah. Right. And so for me, I want to know And I want to study and figure out, okay, here's my 
2024 business strategy. Mm -hmm. Here are the four pillars. Okay, I'm the CDO. How does data support pillar one? You know what? We're not ready to support pillar two, but it can definitely support pillars three and four. C-suite. I'm going to focus there to get the data right and moving there. And in parallel, I'm going to start to move us towards pillar two. We're not ready. And that is a fundamental, I think, shift. Because yeah. to your point, C-suite is throwing money at it. They want to know what's happening. They want the money back. Where's my return? <laughs> Versus, okay, let me... Yes. And so I, I just want to show them, mm. look, this is where we are. This is how we support the business and we will move forward. That to me is a valuable asset. That to me is the right asset of data um, because it's moving us in the right direction. If, if an organization that that's, that's hard though, because yeah, to course. your point, how did it contribute to the bottom line? How I, we invested 10 million. Can we show our ROI was 15 million, maybe mm. because it's an intangible thing that is a part of the process. So there is some mindset that needs to be developed if it's not there. Yeah. It's not always black and white, is it? I want people to get into the gray. Yeah. Right. And I want people to be uncomfortable with uncertainty. Sure. Right. Like one of the examples that I've shared is how many people get big bonuses after working on a project for six months and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right? They don't they don't reward that. And I'm the guy that says I want to reward that because it might not have had the end outcome that I wanted to see, mm -hmm. but look at all the learning we had along this journey of six months that we can implement now. Yeah. And that it, it's just so different. That is a different mindset. We're so set in the ways that, oh, to get a big bonus, you have to have success here and you have to do this. And I look at it and say, that's not data and analytics. It's not no. perfect. No. I would rather have someone who has never done data and analytics in their life and is struggling mightily and none of their projects succeeded in a year, but I can see their growth and how it contributed to the business. I'm going to, I'm going to reward them, but that's not people's mindsets. Yeah. And so I wish that they could start to see data that way. Yeah. Focus on the inputs and not always, it, always the outputs. Yeah. Love that. Okay, yeah. so we're going to move exactly. on to the data lightning quick fire round. So five questions. <laughs> so question number one, what is a misconception about data that you'd like to debunk? Oh, I'll go the easy button. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that, that people who don't understand what it takes think that, yes, I need my results now. Yeah. That is a misconception that <laughs> can harm credibility. It can harm trust. It can harm so much. I want people to understand that this is a process and it takes investment, time, strength. It takes things to make it work. Yeah. Good answer. Name a book, event, or podcast that every data enthusiast should explore. Number one, let's talk data. I'll say they need to explore your podcast. Why, thank you. Um, but for me... <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I, I, I read a lot. Mm. And so for me, I don't know if I have a data book, maybe my first book, if you're trying to get started called mm -hmm. be data literate, I would take a look at books that really deal with your mindset mm. and how you're approaching this. So one I'm studying now is called the greatness mindset by Lewis Howes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm working with a company figuring out how to apply that to their business, oh, cool. even though it's about personal growth, mm -hmm. how can you shift? and do stuff this way. So The Greatness Mindset by Lewis Howes is one. Amazing. And how about an event? Oh, an event. I would take a look and find a conference near you and go network. Yes. Get to know people. Yeah. I think that matters greatly, mm -hmm. right? I know you talk, there's going to be Let's Talk Data events. Attend them. Get to know people and find mentors who can help you along your journey. Yeah. Okay. What is one piece of advice that you'd give to someone who's starting out their data career? So Nelson Mandela, in fact, if you were to look on that bookshelf, I have multiple <laughs> books. Nelson Mandela is a hero of mine. And he had a quote that goes something like this. Hopefully I don't mess up the words, but it basically says, I never lose. I either win or learn. And yes. in the data space, if you are just beginning, you might stumble. Mm -hmm. Right. You might stumble more than once. Learn from it. Yeah. You didn't lose. Learn from it. You're either getting it right or you're learning on how to get it right. And so that's what I would say. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to do all this. Just get going 
and learn along the way. That, that quote, I never lose, I either win or learn, staple that somewhere so you can see it. Yeah, love that. Number four, finish this sentence. Data is the key to. Happiness. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not for your wife, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, data is the key that can unlock doors that maybe you didn't know could be opened. I don't want yeah. us to be stuck in our mindsets and ways. The moment we think we know, we might be impeding the opening to new wonderful knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so allow data to be the key to unlock new mysteries in your mind. I love that. Nailed it. And last one, what do you think will be the most significant development in the next five years in data? Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know about development, but I would say more focus on maybe the human element. Maybe I think that okay. um, because the tools and technology are going to keep developing, mm -hmm. making it possibly that we need less technical skills, but we need more foundational skills. We need more interpretation, reading, analyzing, and communication skills. That might be where I see it going, um, where the innovation and the development make it so we ourselves, instead of becoming the ones building, are the ones utilizing. Yeah. And I think that could be pretty cool if we could do it right. Yeah, absolutely. We need that shift, don't we? And maybe it does, like we said, starts with early education. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I would absolutely love your mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's, it's pretty nerdy, Emma. It's pretty nerdy. <laughs> I must say, I love it. Everything you put on LinkedIn, you always sign off. Stay nerdy. Absolutely. Yeah, stay nerdy, my friends. Always. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you very much. Um, did you enjoy? Oh, I, I could talk about these topics all day. Absolutely. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much. There is a bit more acceptance for actually you're in a position because you know mm -hmm. what you're doing. You know what you're talking about. Whereas a while ago, it was very much a perception that, well, they're in that position because it's a different face, isn't it? 